Frank Lloyd Wright fans, fans of modern architecture, organic architecture, and welcome to part two of my four-part series on renting Frank Lloyd Wright, which are four houses that are available for rent, although one of them, the presentation I gave on part one on the Penfield house, last I heard that house was maybe up for sale, so I don't know if they're um, if you're able to stay in that house. So you need to just, just Google that, uh, the Penfield House in Ohio and check on that. Today's presentation is number two. We are going to be going to the Palmer House in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, don't wanna bore, get into too many of the historical facts and details and dates and things like that too much. Um, wanna just go over general information here to start and then get right into um, a tour of the house with photographs and um, explain the architecture to you and the genius of Frank Lloyd Wright. And so in this house, the client was William and Mary Palmer and their two children. It is a one story house of about 2000 square feet. Pretty typical for Mr. Wright. He liked, I think one story houses better than two story. He could spread them out on the landscape, have more of nature coming in directly. Um, so this is a one-story house completed in 1952. And this house is really interesting and really cool because it's designed on a 30, 60 degree triangular planning module. Um, Mr. Wright always used a planning grid, uh, especially for his Usonian houses, which are houses that he designed from 1936, beginning with the Jacobs house until his death in 1959. Usonian houses were cleaner, more simple houses uh, designed for the modest middle class typical American family, or they were supposed to be. Um, they were supposed to be economical and affordable. Some were, most weren't, just because um, you know, Mr. Wright uh, was uh, interested in the details and the architecture and trying to provide the best architectural design that he can provide at the least possible cost for his design. Not the least possible cost in general, but he was pushing the envelope. And um, so the costs were sometimes more expensive than the budget and than other typical houses of the day. Um, so the 3060 triangular grid, um, you know, Wright thought that the 90 degree corner, you know, the typical corner is, is more restrictive than the 120 degree angle. So um, which the 3060 uh, triangle will give you um, in most areas of the house. So he thought it was kind of more conducive to the human movement of to and fro. Um, so again, when Wright, he's trying to destroy the box, uh, this definitely achieved that. Again, all of Wright's Usonians, he was trying to design and build what he called thoroughbreds, um, a minimum of materials for simple brick, in this case, concrete floors, his typical Cherokee red concrete floor, glass, cypress wood, there's steel in this house and in the wood roof structure. And you'll see um, these huge cantilevers, the roof extends out, um, several feet beyond the structure and that is supported by steel. Wright was very personally involved in this design. Not that he wasn't with all of his designs, but this one more so. Um, uh, you know, obviously as busy as he was, especially in the last 20, 30 years of his career, um, he had a, uh, his apprentices, um, his students, um, which were one and the same. He had his, his school of architecture that he and Olga Ivana, his wife, created. So um, obviously the apprentices were doing most of the construction drawings and, and doing the actual work. Wright was, of course, designing. But in this case, he was just, he wrote and said that he was more personally involved um, in this one. And, uh, and, and uh, so again, with the unique grid, with the unique triangle, triangular grid, um, you can you know, we'll we'll explore that and you'll see how amazing it is. He did visit the house twice, um, 
and he uh, apparently he slept in one of the beds. And uh, of course, as an avid Frank Lloyd Wright fan, I too had to sleep in that bed, hoping that some of the genius would rub off on me. And I'm still waiting for that to happen. Um, this house, of course, is a complete work of art, which all of Mr. Wright's buildings were. And that mainly means that part is to whole as whole is to part. All the design elements are integrated. So the smaller details are part of the bigger overall picture and everything relates. Um, it is available for rent, like I said, just Google the Palmer House, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and then lastly, I have on here at the bottom, uh, Vitruvius, uh, architect of the first century BC. He had um, sort of his principles of design that were firmitas, utilitas, and venustas or were sort of reinterpreted today as commodity, firmness, and delight. And I stress that venustas part, delight, because I feel that that's what Mr. Wright's architecture gave uh, to the occupants, the clients, to visitors. Um, and I think that architecture today can sometimes not express that um, not seem to have that kind of feeling, that sense of delight, which can was a variety of different things with Mr. Wright. It could have been some, some colored glass, um, could have been some decorative geometric pattern in, <clears throat> in the, uh, the panel boards in the windows or along the fascia, um, some repetitive detail, some geometric motif. Um, and you'll see some of that in this house. Um, and so again, I think that's what Mr. Wright brought to modern architecture that what most people think of as modern architecture, you know, usually there's this sense of minimalism, steel and glass, boxy, um, you know, gray concrete floors, white walls, um, very stripped down and just a skeleton. But Mr. Wright was, was very against that. Again, we always start with the site as Mr. Wright did. Um, and you can see the house here, it's the triangular uh, grid and the triangulation of the house and this main road that comes around here. And then all of this is just uh, trees, landscaping. And it's just, a, again, a beautiful site as Mr. Wright's clients always seem to get. So you come up the, the main road here and then up the drive uh, to the carport uh, here and then into the main house here. Which we will, uh, which we will go over here again. The site, um, again, all the trees, uh, the landscape. Yeah, there was slope to the site, so as you can see, Mr. Wright, kind of uh, the slope of the of the site comes up high um, at the house line here, and then slopes down. Um, so Mr. Wright has part of the house literally buried into the site. Again, this floor plan, this was a lot of fun to draw. Um, again, I tried to uh, draw it in the style of Frank Lloyd Wright's presentation drawings where he typically used um, this sort of cream colored trace paper. And then he uh, usually, usually used ink and pen and ink on, on trace paper. Um, so here's the carport. Again, you see this triangular grid throughout the entire house. We come into the carport, uh, no garage, no garage doors. Mr. Wright said, we're not corralling horses anymore. The car isn't going anywhere. Um, we just need a, a protective roof over it. Um, of course, nowadays, you know, with security issues, um, garages aren't a bad idea with garage doors, um, but this is back in the 50s when there wasn't quite that concern. Mr. Wright always had a, a tool shop that supported the roof out at one end. And then look, even the columns are triangles. Um, we'll come up the stairs here to the, another flight of stairs again, again, following the terrain of the site and enter here. We have living, large living dining space with the terrace beyond that. And this is this large roof overhang way out that is supported by concealed steel beams, uh, the kitchen or the workspace area, somewhat concealed, 
um, unlike today, but Wright invented the open plan. Um, so we have him to thank for that. But back then there was still some, some sort of concealment of the kitchen and cooking and um, what Mr. Wright called the workspace. It's a little mud room here. Um, this little set of stairs here goes down to a small basement underneath here that has the water heater and the furnace, um, some, some, of the, some of the utility functions like that. And that was actually, Mr. Wright did design that, but I think at first he did not have that in the, in the design. And uh, Mrs. Palmer asked for a, a small basement for storage. Um, I think they used to can jellies and jams and things like that too. Um, and, and Mr. Wright apparently said something to the effect of, you know, what is it with my Midwest clients and their basements? Because of course, Mr. Wright was very anti-basement, anti-attic. Um, they were expensive. Uh, they, were, they were dark and damp and musty. Um, and so uh, Mr. Wright was, was trying to avoid those expenses and those conditions. But apparently Ms. Palmer, Mrs. Palmer kind of insisted on it. And Mr. Wright uh, acquiesced and said, no, no, I'll, I, I better design it. Otherwise, you'll just do it anyway. <laughs> So he kind of relented on that one. And then we have the bedroom wing here, master bedroom. Again, uh, the fireplace back to back uh, here, and then bathrooms, and then the bedrooms here. Uh, this study here was actually added on a second uh, rendition of the floor plan after revisions were requested by the Palmers. At, at <clears throat> Originally, I think this wall just continued down to here but uh, they wanted a study. And so again, you follow the grid and Mr. Wright extended this out. And that's what sort of um, is sort of uh, uh, encapsulated by the landscape right up almost to the windows. So it's kind of buried into the landscape here because the hill is higher here than down here. So again, you see this triangular grid all the way through. Now, this is, uh, <laughs> the typical floor plan, right? And I, I say that kind of jokingly, but, you know, Mr. again, Mr. Wright was against the box. And uh, sometimes when I give talks or when I'm just talking to colleagues or clients, you know, I say, I feel like we're all mice trying to get the cheese in, these, in our buildings that we live and work in today. And everything's a maze of boxes and, and rooms and openings and hallways. And, you know, if you were to take the roof off, we would all kind of look like mice running around this maze. Wright was very much against that. And obviously I think as you can see in this floor plan, the complete antithesis of this, the common typical plan. So we'll start on the outside. We'll swing our way kind of around the house and then we'll enter the front door and tour the inside of the house. So this is the back side of the carport. Carport's over here. These are those triangular support piers. Uh, these large roof overhangs that Mr. Wright always did, always providing a sense of shelter, protection, security, comfort. Here's the uh, living dining uh, area here. There's this large roof overhang supported by concealed steel in here. Uh, again, the materials being the brick and the cypress. <clears throat> This right here is a, a terrace that extends beyond the living room. So we've come around the house here. Carport was back here. Triangular support piers here. Again, these glass French doors out from the living room. That Cherokee red concrete floor and the grid pattern extends out. Lots of glass open to the views of the landscape that's behind us. Mr. Wright always gave privacy towards the street. So fewer to no windows on the street side, and then it completely opens up the house towards the views to nature. Here's the living room, French doors, glass, brick piers. There's this uh, the brick planter here. Mr. Wright always typically tried to 
create a planter as part of the architecture, <clears throat> excuse me, to combine the architecture with nature and, and embrace it. Stepping down out into the site a little bit, even these steps here, the continuation of the steps closer to the house, relating the architecture to the landscape, the architecture extends out beyond the house. Here's the carport back here. Now, I put these slides in here because, again, this is the typical American house. Now, this is, of course, built you know, 10, 20 years ago. But <clears throat> this is what Mr. Wright was against. False ornamentation that has no function. These are these colonial shutters that don't function. If you closed these, they wouldn't even close off the window, even if they were operable. The proportions are, 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 are not, not the greatest. Um, you know, this window here doesn't even center on the roof. Um, you've just got some quirky, strange conditions. The typical house, as Mr. Wright called, boxes within a box. Uh, that again, that Mr. Wright was completely against. You have this sort of mannered, manicured landscaping here in rows. Mr. Wright was, was against all of that. He wanted everything to be natural, in tune with the site, in harmony with the site, with nature, with the materials. Back to the house. Again, this is the living room, dining area. There's the fireplace here to the living room and on the backside to the master bedroom and then the <clears throat> bedroom wing back there. Planters, same material, the brick out beyond into the landscape, ex again, extending the architecture out into the landscape. Now we've swung all the way back around to the front of the house. Even this <clears throat> termination of the brick here is in a triangle. These pierced uh, concrete uh, openings and small windows here in a ge geometric motif and pattern. Um, that had something to do with the plan of the house, the geometric motif of the triangles. Uh, Mr. Wright always did a particular specific pattern to each house he designed. None of, no two were the same. And so this is the pattern for the Palmer house. Here are those stairs, <clears throat> excuse me, down to the basement. There is actually is a planter here. And then here we'll up the stairs to the front door here. The carport, the triangular brick piers. Mr. Wright extends this the concrete, Cherokee, Cherokee red floor all the way out to the to the carport. And also the pattern of the grid module is inscribed everywhere in the concrete. The steps follow the slope of the site. As you can see, this is a retaining wall here. The, the grass is here. <clears throat> Custom design light fixture in the front, again, in tune with the geometric motif of the house. When you enter the house, you turn left, you look at the living room. Here are these French doors to the terrace outside. Two brick piers supporting steel beams above. Here's some of that delight I was talking about. Mr. Wright incorporates a little lighting detail into those piers. It's just, those are the things that just give the design charm that you just don't see in the modern architecture of today. All of the furniture was designed by Mr. Wright. These hassocks, built-ins, dining room chair and table. These origami chairs, which are plywood and origami, I think is a very fitting term because it looks like the plywood has been folded like paper. Now we're in the living room. Front door was here, we came in, large fireplace here, uh, the brick coming out here, built in furniture. Look, even the seat cushions follow the grid and the angle of the inscribed lines in the floor. Again, 
same material inside is out, the cypress wood forms a light shelf here, brings the scale down, and that light shelf continues all the way around. Brick inside, same material inside is out, the roof extends out through the glass. There's that geometric pattern in the block again, and the brick here. Dining area, you can move this, this table is movable, but it, but it conforms to the grid of the angles of the uh, grid of the house, of the design. Moving over into the living room area, looking back at the dining area and the kitchen area beyond. Again, these light, this light motif, these designs of light pattern, just providing a little bit of joy and happiness in the design. The built in, this is called a hob, by the way. Mr. Wright always had, typically had these in his fireplace designs. Mr. Wright also <clears throat> designed fireplaces that went down to the floor. He didn't design many raised hearths, um, which is kind of a little side note. Cherokee red concrete floor. Here's the pattern of the design of the house in the floor, inscribed in the floor. <clears throat> and even the edges of the table, the design of the table, everything conforms. Even this clipping of the corner of the built in uh, banquette here, everything conforms to the design of the angles of the geometry. Now into the kitchen. Couple of stories about this. Um, first of all, again, here are those small, those geometric patterns. Um, let's light in, does let view. This is the front uh, walk here, front doors over here. So if you're in the kitchen, you can see who's coming and going. Um, but apparently the neighbors at some parties that the Palmers had would sometimes comment, you know, oh, Mary, too bad you don't have any windows in your kitchen. To which Mary Palmer replied, on the contrary, I have 28 of them or however many openings here that there were. So a little tongue in cheek answer there. Um, secondly, uh, this kitchen, which Mr. Wright, remember we said that he visited the house twice. Apparently Mr. Wright walked into this kitchen the first time he saw it and he commented, oh, I've given you a pretty good kitchen, to which Mary replied, yes, but I had to work on you a bit to get it. And Mr. Wright typically designed small kitchens, um, but Mary Palmer said that they entertain a lot. She wanted a bigger kitchen for entertaining, for, for larger meal prep, cooking, and uh, so I think she got her wish. Um, lastly, it was pointed out to us by the then current owners, I don't know if they still are, that there is no, there are no poles or hardware on these doors and drawers, which is true. And he said that in order to open this top drawer, you have to open the bottom one, then the next one, then the next one, and then to get to the top drawer. He said that, you know, the owner didn't know if it was on the plans that way, but that there is no hardware on these doors. Um, I find that kind of hard to believe that Mr. Wright would have done that that way. Um, in all the other houses I've been in, I remember there being door and drawer pulls. So not sure what happened there, <laughs> but apparently Mrs. Palmer, Mr. and Mrs. Palmer lived with it for all those years. Um, so a little side note there. Back out of the kitchen in the dining area looking towards the front door here. And then again, even the stairs inside the house because the site slopes up this way towards the bedroom. So that's expressed in the house. The house follows the site contour lines. There is a storage closet here for coats, which Mr. Wright always had. His houses were very functional, very practical. This is that typical gallery, as Mr. Wright called it, the hallway to the bedrooms, the triangular lights following the geometric motif of the project. 
Here are those pierced uh, windows again up high with the geometric pattern again. The ground line is about right here. And this faces the street, so privacy is afforded. Light is able to come in and you get that geometric motif and that geometric repetition throughout the design of the house. Master bedroom, even the bed is designed to conform with the, to be parallel with the line, the triangular lines of the grid. So custom mattress, even the corner here clipped off, the angle of the nightstands built in, this is all built in, everything conforms to the planning module. As you turn, you have a little makeup area here, a little vanity with this mirror that I think if I remember correctly, I think it folds down. So it folds up when you want, when it's in use. Piano hinge here, Mr. Wright always used piano hinges. Um, they looked good. They provided stability. They kept the wood straight and um, it's what Mr. Wright always used and always preferred. Master bedroom still looking towards the fireplace in the master bedroom. And this is, you know, really a cool idea. So these are the closets. Um, I don't think I turned the lights on above. I wish I had, but uh, there's lights behind here that usually that shine up towards the ceiling. So you get a really great indirect lighting effect. Um, Brings the scale down. Again, I'm sure that this lines up with the window head, the top of the window here. So that line is continuous and just provides some, some depth and some dimension to the space. The second bedroom, a small bedroom, everything conforms to the planning grid. So we have a parallelogram nightstand here, built in bookshelves. The cypress wood, horizontal board and batten continues. The shelves, of course, have to be in line with the, the battens. So there's just this cohesive continuity. All the parts relate, everything aligns. It's very orderly. And here is just a detail of a little built-in desk area. Uh, Mr. Wright's bedrooms were always very small. To him, they were compartments for sleeping, uh, sleeping, studying, reading, some alone time, but he really encouraged you to be outside or in the larger family spaces, the living room, dining area, outside on the terrace. Bedrooms were for, were mainly for sleeping, but triangular light, again, you can't, nothing is conventional, which actually one of uh, Mrs. Palmer's, her daughter, uh, by the way, a lot of my information on this house came from this really good book entitled Frank Lloyd Wright's Palmer House by Grant Hildebrand with Ann and Leonard Eaton. And in that book, uh, the Palmer's daughter said, nothing was conventional. And so how dare you even have a square standard light fixture in a house that's all triangles. You just can't do it because Part is to whole as whole is to part. That's organic architecture or part of it. Another bedroom, like we said, the angles continued. Look at this clipping the corner of the bed, the mattress, the angles all conform to the triangular grid. Another parallelogram nightstand, built-ins, built-in bookshelves light shelf, getting down light and indirect light shines up, just glows on this beautiful polished wood, looks like honey, this sort of honey color. It just provides a warmth, a glow um, that it, it's just, it's just absolutely fantastic. Now, why this? Because this is what this is against. So here is Again, the typical American home. This is actually one of our bedrooms 
in our house before we moved in and before we completely ripped the carpeting out and did all sorts of architectural things to it to make it better than this. But this is the experience every American has in almost every building and every home they enter. It's a box with a hole cut out of one of the exterior, cut out of the exterior wall so that you can look out of and get some light in. You'll never get there from there. I mean, look at the difference. This is what we live in today. So again, when you compare the genius of Frank Lloyd Wright to what's done today, there, there's just no comparison. And when you stay here for two nights or however long you stay, even if you visit for a, a one, two hour tour, but when you get to spend a couple of nights in this house and live with this, coming back to this is utterly depressing. <laughs> Here's that back study area that we said was added in a, another rendition of the design. Uh, Mr. Palmer smoked cigars. So there's an exhaust fan here for that. Triangular light. Skylight here, because remember the earth line is, is almost up to the top of this, almost up to the ceiling here. So light is afforded by this skylight here. It's a very comfortable room. This apparently was the bed that Mr. Wright slept in. So I think I took a nap there. Very comfortable, but it also conforms to the, uh, it's also parallel with the grid pattern planning module of the house. Again, even this angle here at the edge of the built-in desk, everything conforms. Back down the hallway towards the front door, um, lined with books. So, you know, a lot of people say there's no storage in Wright's houses. And that's true if you compare it to today's designs, but, you know, Wright tried to get a lot of storage here. Sometimes he would do cabinet doors below and close that off if you wanted. This is a really neat little area. I don't have sort of cut the photograph off here, but this is a little seating area um, where they could pay bills, take a phone call, just a little work area, just a neat little nook. Again, those are those little, those little bits of charm um, that Mr. Wright was just so good at. It's, it's just like, so humane, um, so different than the modern architecture of today, which is um, kind of sterilized. And then back out the front door, down the steps, back to the carport. Um, and so again, you can see the land is, is up to here. So this is a retaining wall, retaining the earth behind here. Here's that custom light fixture. Again, even the design of this adheres to this specific house and conforms to the geometry of this house. So again, I like to summarize um, all of my talks on Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture and the tours of these homes. Um, in case you didn't catch my first video on the Penfield house. Um, Mr. Wright's architecture created a sense of shelter, which he understood was the main purpose of architecture. And it is, so hence the large overhangs, the scale is brought down to human scale. Um, and the roof line, and the roof was very important to Mr. Wright, but that's what visually provided the sense of shelter. Of course, Mr. Wright was all about a love and respect for nature, nature being the ultimate context within which all buildings exist. Um, street names, again, as on, on the first video, Mr. Wright had the greatest fortune of his clients and these sites that they got for him to design on. I noticed in all of my traveling around the country, I've been in over a hundred or, or more Frank Lloyd Wright buildings all over the country since the nine, I've been traveling since the 1990s. I began to notice that a lot of the buildings and houses were on street names that had a, a nature component to it, like Frogtown Road, Woodchuck Road, Chestnut Hill, Orchard Brook, Sunnybank, Meadow Road, Forest, Springbrook. I just found that just how I, you know, how, how appropriate. Here's the, the greatest architect of all time, the greatest architect who knew how to design in tune with nature, 
I mean, Mr. Wright is just associated with nature. Like he used to say, I spelled nature with an N capital and go there for my church. And uh, I noticed that a lot of his houses were on streets named uh, with some sort of nature component. Um, Donna Penfield, the last talk I gave, part one, the Penfield house, you know, had conversations with either Frank Lloyd Wright homeowners or descendants of homeowners or family members in some way or current owners of the house. And we were talking about what it was about Mr. Wright's architecture that was so appealing, that felt so good, that was so, um, uh, you know, what, what made it so revered. And she said, because it, it returns you to your natural biorhythms. And you really do experience that uh, in his houses. And that's why it's great to stay a couple of nights in these houses, because you really get a sense of what it's like to live. And I put that in quotes, uh, because of course, we're not, we're not living in it nearly long enough. But um, you really do get a sense of, of what it's like to live in this kind of architecture. And it is thrilling, and it is much better than the painted drywall boxes with holes cut out of them for windows that we live in today. Again, so supremely human, humane architecture. Again, those little details with the lights in the living room, the pattern um, throughout the house, the geometry, that geometric pattern of those, those sort of pierced blocks uh, in the kitchen and the hallway. It's those little things that just make it humane. It, it, it doesn't make it this sort of, sort of robotic, uh, soulless, sterilized box. Um, right, Mr. Wright always said his architecture was to represent a grace to its site rather than a disgrace, and that the building should belong where you see it standing, and it should look like it belongs where you see it standing. And the Palmer House is a great example of that, where Mr. Wright designs that study and that bedroom wing literally into the landscape. He doesn't bulldoze the ground down. He doesn't flatten the site. He works with the contours, very unlike today. These houses are an alternate universe. Um, they are environments of possibility, beauty, privacy, and as Mr. Wright used to describe his architecture, where everyone has peace, space, and comfort. Um, when you visit these houses, when you, and when you get to stay in these houses, there's no TV. And if you turn your phone off for a few hours or longer, I recommend, it, it, you, you just, it's quiet. You can open the windows, you can hear the birds, you can feel the breeze. You just are relaxed, it's calm, peaceful, and you do become more attuned to nature, more in harmony with it. it it's, it's a palpable experience. Complete work of art, as we said before, part is to whole, as whole is to part, um, which we saw um, that the house is a part of the landscape and it's a part of the environment, it's completely connected to the landscape. So again, I can't emphasize enough that Mr. Wright does not bulldoze these sites flat to make them buildable. He works with the existing contours. Um, Mr. Wright's architecture, organic architecture, was, was for the free democratic individual, unconstrained by styles. All right, so Mr. Wright was trying to represent democracy with his architecture. And if you're constrained by styles, the style of the day, the trend of the day, colonial architecture, classical architecture, Georgian architecture, then you're constrained, your hands are tied by that style. Then you're gonna have the shutters that don't function and uh, the details and the boxes within the boxes, the formality of that because you have to follow the rules of that style. And of course, Mr. Wright was very much against that. He was an individualist. Of course, every house he designed for every client was unique uh, to be uh, in line with our democracy, so creative uh, individuality. There are guest books in all of these houses. And 
in reading through that guest book, it was fascinating to sit there and read everyone else's comments on their stay at these houses. Incredible words of inspiration. People talking about how spiritual their experience was, almost religious, um, how tranquil and peaceful it was, how it was life-changing, how it was just glorious, the, how they, they now understood the genius of Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, the praise, the lavish praise people have in their experience of these houses that they, able, that they were able to share in the guest book, it's worth a read and it confirms what I believe, which is why I love visiting any Frank Lloyd Wright building any day, is they are exciting, they're unique, they're completely different, but not just to be, not just for difference sake. Uh, when the tour guide explains the design, the rationality behind it all, it's hard to argue with. And yes, we can argue with leaky roofs and low ceilings and dark corridors here and there. But gosh, when you, when you get to stay a couple of nights in them, the experience uh, you have, uh, what you learn from them is life-changing. Uh, they'll always take it with you. And like I said, when you come back home to your box, which I'm kind of in right now, we all are, it, it's pretty depressing. Houses, again, that spiritual simplicity. Um, again, people in the guest books wrote about how kind of a spiritual experience it was. Simplicity, can't stress that enough, right? was all about declutter. Don't have more than you need. Uh, simplicity of the design allowing the materials to be what they are, not painting them, not carving them, not covering them, um, minimizing the materials, again, to design that thoroughbred. He's trying to keep costs down. He's trying to create an overall cohesive environment um, in tune with nature. Um, and uh, so the Usonian houses were a, a study in simplicity. And I always like to end with um, a speech that a gentleman named Ralph Walker gave to Frank Lloyd Wright in Mr. Wright's acceptance of the gold medal, uh, which was an American Institute of Architects award, highest award uh, that they can give to an architect. Mr. Wright wasn't a member of the AIA, but uh, they gave it to him anyway, finally, very late in his career. But this speech is absolutely it's fantastic. I gave it, and I'm going to give it in all my talks uh, on these four houses that we stayed in because it's just so incredible and impressive um, and kind of uh, has something to do with today, with what's going on today as well. So Mr. Walker said of Mr. Wright, you design your buildings as if they were to take their place in a happier world, one of light, of grace, of gaiety, and for human beings who are not burdened with fear, for humans who live in a world where what seems possible is actually so, and where the pioneer concept of democracy seems a reality. All your life you have denied the minimum and have reached for the stars. A free man in a free land, you have asked a drab society to compromise with you on the basis of your ideals. And with that, we end. Next time, presentation number three, we will visit the Bernard Schwartz House in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. And I look forward to seeing you all then on YouTube. And until then, I bid you goodbye and farewell.